I'd like to welcome the Honourable Stephen Marshall, MP Premier of South Australia, to the webinar. He's going to talk to us about the stewardship through COVID-19, the impact of COVID-19 emergency conditions and restarting our economy for Aboriginal communities and regions. So welcome, Mr Premier. Thanks very much, Candy. And uh, can I begin by acknowledging that uh, today I'm on the traditional lands of the Kaurna people, who acknowledge their ongoing spiritual relationship with this precious land, but also uh, pay my respects to those people who are meeting on other lands right across uh, our state at the moment. Can I also acknowledge uh, not only yourself, uh, Clinton, but also Professor Alex Brown uh, from the Wadler Paringa Aboriginal Research Unit from uh, the fabulous uh, Samri, and also the co-host Steve Tully, who's the chair of the Health Performance Council, and of course our Commissioner for Aboriginal Engagement, Dr Roger Thomas, and all of you uh, who are participating in this forum. I really want to thank you for inviting me back uh, to speak to you. Last time we met was soon after I uh, became elected as the Premier, and I think I told you about how um, I got a, I was elected as Premier, so I appointed myself as the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation in South Australia. We were down at Townday, um, and today, of course, we're not because we're in the middle of this um, uh, situation with the coronavirus. Um, and uh, it is quite an incredible situation, but I do thank you all for coming on to this webinar this afternoon. I've spent a lot more of my life on one of these things uh, than uh, quite frankly, I thought I ever would. But I would say that it's actually quite an effective way to meet a lot of people uh, from right across the state, uh, you know, in, in short time. So for that, uh, I'm pretty grateful. Today, I've just finished doing, um, I had my, Economic Advisory Council this morning and the National Cabinet, and I've just done a, a, a press conference with Professor Nicholas Spurrier just with regards to what's happening uh, at the moment uh, with regards to the coronavirus. Um, to cut it short, we are extraordinarily concerned now about what is happening over in Victoria. There are currently in excess of 100 separate outbreaks. You might recall we had three outbreaks in South Australia, two up in the in the Barossa and then one down at the Adelaide Airport. Uh, they've got more than 100 uh, over there in Victoria at the moment. And the, and the biggest problem is that the vast majority of their new infections are all under investigation. They don't know what the epi link of the original infection was. So they're, in, they're really in a, in a pretty bad way. They had 300 today, 404 yesterday, 484 on Wednesday. To put that into perspective, we've only had 447 since January for the whole of South Australia. And they had 484 just on Wednesday, and they just really don't know where those infections have come from. So um, there's real concerns about that. We've got a hard border in place at the moment with Victoria. Um, this doesn't allow Victorians to come in at all. As of Tuesday at midnight, we're not even allowing South Australians to come back in. And we don't take this decision lightly, but it is worrying. We've had three new infections this week. All of them have come over the border. Uh, admittedly, people are doing the right thing and they've abided by all of the restrictions and they've self-isolated and they've had their tests, but all three of them have come across uh, the border. Uh, and we are really looking to tighten up on those essential workers there. Um, we're, we're tightening up on our border communities and we're basically saying it's a hard border um, with uh, all citizens coming from Victoria as of Tuesday night. And we're also putting some further restrictions in in metropolitan and, and country SA as well. We're going to put a maximum of 100 people for weddings, 100 people for, for funerals, um, and, uh, and we're probably just going to tighten up on some of the licensing arrangements that we've got uh, in South Australia, a maximum of 50 for those home gatherings. So, you probably think um, that's pretty tough, but to be quite honest, we don't want to have what's happening in Victoria come here. Uh, we've already seen a little bit of seeding uh, over into New South Wales with three big clusters there, one at the Crossroads pub, uh, one at the Batemans Bay Soldiers Club and one at the Thai Rock uh, restaurant. They are getting on top of them, but you know we're not lifting the border with New South Wales and ACT. It's a softer border, so you can come in, but you've got to do the two weeks uh, mandatory isolation. Unfortunately, from Victoria, as of Tuesday night, you just can't come in uh, at all. So that's what we've uh, announced there. Um, I've got to say, first of all, that really since this came to light in 
late January of this year and really started to get going in, in early March uh, in South Australia. Um, I feel uh, that we've had exceptionally good leadership amongst our Aboriginal communities uh, in South Australia. They've had to make some tough decisions, um, actually some very tough decisions uh, regarding keeping um, members of different Aboriginal communities protected. They've opted in for the Biosecurity uh, Act uh, designated area status. Um, and we had, I think, nine separate areas in total uh, which did this. Uh, my understanding is that they have all opted out of this uh, now. It was the community's decision to opt in, wasn't inflicted upon anybody, and it has been the community's decision to opt out. And I really genuinely do want to um, thank uh, and acknowledge the leadership of these different communities because it wasn't an easy decision to do it because it really put very heavy restrictions on movements in and out uh, for, for, for goods, for services, and just for people. Uh, it really um, dislocated families. Uh, and uh, so it was a tough decision. It wasn't always, if we're truthful about it, um, a unanimous decision in each community. And in fact, we know that this caused a lot of friction uh, in some communities. But my strong belief is that the community leadership that we have in South Australia made the decisions uh, that were in the best interests of their community at the time. Uh, as I said, they've come out of those arrangements now, uh, but it's not to say that they won't go in if they need to uh, put those protections in place going forward, because we really are talking about a very, very nasty disease. Um, we had another, I think, six people that have died overnight in Victoria. That's on top of five people that died yesterday. So this isn't going away. So for those people that think, well, you know, we've done really well, it's all over. And I think there was a bit of that thinking, to be quite honest, three or four weeks ago, maybe five, six weeks ago, as we were starting to lift some of the restrictions in South Australia. I don't think anybody's thinking that anymore. In fact, yesterday was the highest number of tests we've had in the history of the pandemic here in South Australia, over 4,000 tests. I still remember we've been sitting around the 1,500, 1,700, maybe 2,000 for a long period of time. I remember Nicola Sperrier three weeks ago saying she wanted to see that number higher than 3,000. And I thought, I don't know whether you're going to get it, Nicola, even though everybody loves you. I'm not sure you're going to get it because a lot of people are just not thinking it's a problem here. She said, we've got to get it. And the good news is over 4,000 yesterday. So people are really listening to her. She's uh, providing real leadership in that area. So as I said, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really, really super grateful for the work that um, she is doing. I've also got to say, um, I want to acknowledge the work uh, of Roger Thomas, our Commissioner for Aboriginal Engagement in South Australia. One of the things that I've asked him to do is to design a new enga Aboriginal engagement or governance uh, structure for us here uh, between government and, uh, and the uh, various Aboriginal communities in South Australia. And he's uh, presented us now with his uh, interim recommendations. We were sort of hoping uh, that we would be able to get this sort of finalised this year, but with COVID, it has been difficult for that final level of um, consultation. Uh, but I do want to say thank you very much. And we as a government are 100% committed uh, to this uh, cause. It was something uh, which was um, included in our very first Aboriginal Action Plan in South Australia, which we published in December. I think, or November or December of 2018, was um, dozens of different um, items that we wanted to address as a whole of government approach. Uh, I've got to say that uh, apart from one or two of these items, we are on track or have delivered them. Uh, and we are continuing to work with the um, South Australian Aboriginal Advisory Council, the SAC, who are meeting with the Cabinet uh, twice per year to hold us to account. Um, it's the only group that we meet with. Um, I'm very proud that we continue to have this dialogue where the SAC holds us to account. They ask us how we're going with each of the items on the action plan. And now we're working together on what are the items that as we take some items off, uh, we can put uh, new items back on. Um, in South Australia, we do have at the moment uh, in excess of 2,200 uh, Aboriginal members uh, or public serve, public sector employees who identify uh, as uh, Aboriginal. This is absolutely 
the highest on record, and Emma Ranieri is really proud of this. But um, many of those uh, people are at the entry level. There's a large number of them that are at the entry level, and so we're embarking upon uh, the work that we need to do to uh, have, um, if you like, management development uh, courses in place. Uh, we've had three of them so far, and I know from participants that have been on them that they've got a lot of really good, um, really good um, uh, development opportunities from that. Unfortunately, a lot of them, after they finish the course, don't stay in the public service and they get a job in the private sector uh, after we do all of that work. But in a way, I'm really pleased um, that we can do that, but we've got to think about how we can accelerate um, more work uh, in this area to get more uh, Aboriginal people at higher levels within the South Australian uh, public service. Um, what else would I like to talk about uh, today? Obviously, um, I'm on the Joint Council uh, at the moment and we're signing off as we speak uh, on the new um, Closing the Gap refresh, uh, which is jointly chaired by Ken White and Pat Turner. Uh, and uh, in South Australia, I think we've been really uh, well served with uh, Ruth Miller and also Cheryl Axelby working uh, with that uh, Council of Peaks uh, on what that refresh should be uh, doing. We had a meeting of the Joint Council the week before last uh, where myself uh, and Ruth uh, and actually David O'Loughlin from South Australia, who's the president of the Australian Local Government Association, were all in a room and we were participating in those discussions. Uh, I think they're being finalised at the moment through COAG, the Council of Australian Government, and that will be finalised in the next week or so. Um, it's one thing to set, um, if you like, uh, a new refresh for the Closing the Gap, and I think it is uh, genu generally regarded as a massive improvement on the first Closing the Gap, which uh, seemed to everybody to be uh, determined by government and then basically uh, everybody was told, well, there you go, that's what uh, what we're doing now. With this one, it's been co-designed. Uh, there has been quite a lot of argy-bargy uh, around uh, the, the table, but I think what we've ended up with is um, a much better plan that's going to have community-controlled organisations really at the centre of delivering against those uh, new objectives. We're just trying to work out in South Australia what is the exact way that we will respond to that? So it's one thing to set the objectives, then we've got to work out how we're going to bring that down into actions at the state level. I think we're probably going to incorporate a lot of our response to the closing the gap into the refresh of our own state-based Aboriginal action plan, because that means that all members of the Cabinet are bound to it, uh, and it means that the SAC or whatever new consultative organisation uh, we derive will be holding the government to account um, uh, on the way through. So uh, I think that that's a positive. Um, I think that's a positive um, way to go. Um, just back to COVID, um, we are still extraordinarily concerned about this disease, and in particular how it affects people in remote communities, uh, and in particular um, how. Um, those people with uh, vulnerable health uh, are affected. And so um, we're very pleased uh, for the work uh, that you're doing uh, on this uh, forum, uh, putting advice into government. Obviously, since coming to government, we have a different, um, I think, more uh, detailed engagement around Aboriginal health. We've gone from having five local uh, health networks in South Australia to 10. So we've got the North, South and Central, we've got the women's and children's, and instead of having one for the whole of Country SA, uh, we've got six. Uh, and uh, on each of those 10 new boards, uh, we have Aboriginal representation at the board making those decisions. So um, we've really devolved the governance um, down to the board level. Um, so uh, a much greater focus on making decisions uh, as close to the action as possible and having Aboriginal representation on each of those boards is absolutely crucial and I know that the um, yeah. the Minister, Stephen Wade, uh, has uh, been very grateful for the input that he has had um, and is very keen to see how we can continue to develop uh, leaders uh, with the requisite skills and capacities to continue to um, have input into developing an improved health system for us 
uh, here in South Australia. So, uh, Mr Chairman, that's really, uh, they were the introductory remarks, if you like, uh, for what I wanted to say, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that people uh, may have for me. Um, very happy to answer all and any questions that you might have for me. Over, back to you. Okay, thank you, Mr Premier. Mr Premier, um, I might kick off with a question. Um, bearing in mind we had a lockdown and we don't know in the future whether we will have lockdowns again in our communities because we don't know what's going to happen with COVID-19. What were some of the steps taken to ensure that communities weren't adversely affected in access to essential goods and services and food supplies and healthcare services? We've had the experience already, you've learned from it and um, can you tell us about some of those steps and what lessons you may have learned for any future lockdowns? Yeah, look, it's a really good uh, question because um, obviously this was not something that we had really rehearsed or, or there was planning in place, but actually putting it into practice is another thing. Um, obviously the uh, various uh, community councils uh, worked with uh, DPCR, the Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation Division, which is now back in the central agency of the Department of Premier and Cabinet. So uh, they were working with uh, Kirsty uh, and obviously Nerida. Um, we uh, had a few bumps along the way. I'm first to uh, admit that, probably not as much so as um, people in other states and territories, um, because we have a lot of community controlled uh, stores uh, certainly on the AP Wildlands and in some uh, areas, but there were there were difficulties. Uh, the whole country, if you like, had difficulties accessing some uh, goods. Uh, you know, in particular, toilet paper, which, by the way, I could never actually understand why we ran out of toilet paper and why everybody was going to go and buy toilet paper because it was actually a respiratory. It's a respiratory illness, so I'm not sure what they were doing. Uh, with all of this toilet paper uh, that they were getting, but people were hoarding that. It was creating uh, shortages with food stuff as well. So, look, I haven't got an up to date. Um, I haven't got up to date feedback with Nerida, but I think now is the time that we should be reviewing exactly what happened, what those stock levels should be, what those freight routes should be. Don't forget, in the first instance, we weren't even sure whether trucks were going to continue to operate. Uh, and in fact, there were some really elaborate plans put in place in the first instance where trucks would sort of have to pull up at the border. There'd have to be a changeover, a cleaning out of the cab, and then a changeover to the driver. Now, thankfully, we never went to that area, and there still are very strong, uh, tight restrictions put in place on those uh, truck drivers. But we do need to keep things uh, moving. But I'm, I'm more than happy to go to Ard and ask for... Um, if you like, a, a bit of an overview of what happened and whether there's things that we could be doing right now uh, to guard mm -hmm. against it, because I think you're right, it could happen again. I hope it doesn't, but it could happen again. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I was a child during the times of when um, we as a community needed permission to move in and out of our community. My mother's from Rackin, my father's from Point Pierce. I grew up on Point Pierce. For our annual Christmas holiday in Raukin, we had to get permission from the superintendent at Point Pierce and the superintendent at Raukin. And for some of my relatives at Point Pierce, they felt that like it was a bit of a revisit to the mission management days. So what is happening in terms of um, support for communities around the mental well-being as a result of the lockdown um, and going forward? Because I know there was a fair bit of angst in communities and and sure, we want to re-kick the economy and all of those things, but I'm also concerned about the well-being of our communities. Yeah, no, I think that's a really good question, and thanks for sharing that situation. It was pointed out to me on a number of occasions that people saw that parallel uh, between restrictions that might have been in place during the uh, old mission days and, and the biosecurity uh, designated area. Uh, restrictions that were put in place. So I, I think um, whilst it brought back um, some very strong uh, emotions and memories for people, it was quite different. Like this was not something that was imposed. Uh, and in fact, it was really communities themselves that decided to put these in place and, and to take them off. And of course, many communities 
uh, Clinton decided not to put them in place, and that was fine as well. I, I think everybody just need to, to me, this is almost like a uh, an issue of um, self-management, self-determination, where individual committees can make that decision based upon the vulnerability of their citizens. And just also, um, I know it was, for, for example, very difficult in Davenport, where they're so close uh, to Port Augusta and the movement in and out and cutting people off from being able to go to the shops and how do you do it? It, it caused a lot of uh, stress and, and concern. Um, look, I don't have a specific answer in terms of what uh, mental health supports have been provided, but again, I'm happy to ask that question to Stephen Wade. I think he's acutely aware of um, this whole of person wellbeing approach to health. Um, it's one of the reasons why he calls his portfolio health and wellbeing. One of the things that we did was to uh, create a, um, a an online support for people that were um, really remote, which was called openyourworld.com.au. And I know that there definitely was Aboriginal input uh, into that program. But as for the efficacy of that, I'm not really sure whether that provided the right level of support because it's still, I mean, it's still in place now, um, but you're right, it's, it did bring back some pretty uh, big memories uh, and harsh memories for lots of people. And look, from this forum, I'd be really happy to hear any suggestions people have of things that we could be doing to address that. Um, some people might want to sort of reflect on how acute those feelings were and, and whether there were things done at that community level uh, that we could replicate in other other communities, we'd be really, we'd be very happy to hear it. Um, thanks for that, Mr. Premier. You raised a very important point. It wasn't opt in; it wasn't imposed. So um, that sort of um, information wasn't widely understood earlier on during the lockdown. And I was at pains to point out to people who complained to me that that that's an um, self-determination process where the communities themselves determined to opt into the process and they were free to opt out um, during the process. But it's still I, think about a, I think that's a really good point and it's one that we probably do need to, now that we've got a time, we've got time to breathe after this, because it might be that we've got to go back in. I hope that we don't, but, but I really think it is the time to educate the communities and say, look, this is what happened. You can reflect on whether you thought you needed to do it or not needed to do it and then make decisions about what the triggers would be going forward to go under that same designated area arrangement. They did it right throughout um, many other parts of the country, including the Northern Territory and Western Australia. And I had lots uh, of interaction with um, Premier Mark McGowan in Western Australia and Chief Minister Michael Gunner in the Northern Territory. They probably did it in other areas as well. Um, but in as I said, in our state, we just left it completely up to uh, the community. And it would be interesting now, really, um, to hear whether they thought it was a good idea or not. I did, uh, at one stage, Nerida invited me to go onto the Community Council's chair's uh, weekly meeting uh, with her. I was only on for about an hour, but I did get to hear um, on there about some of the things that affected those communities. Um, and as I said, some agreed, uh, some uh, didn't want to opt in, and some people uh, opted in but had quite a large um, proportion of their community that wanted to opt out, and that created a bit of stress. But I suppose that's why, you know, now in, in the calm of the aftermath, it would be good to sort of sit down and see what we can learn from that for, for the next time. Yeah, um, a debrief would be great, but it is also an opportunity for the Chief Executive of um, Wellbeing SA. Um, um, Lynn Dean to get involved and, and see whether there's something that she can look at in terms of the overall wellbeing. Yeah, I'll follow up with Lynn, Lynn actually, because I'd like to hear her thoughts on what we've done with openyourworld.com.au and how many people got in touch and whether they found it useful. So I'll definitely follow that up. Uh, Mr Premier, Tricia Cash here from uh, the Royal Adelaide Hospital. I'm actually uh, acting for Kerry Riley, uh, who is normally sitting in this chair. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to, I suppose, share is that um, the concept uh, that we went through with the biosecurity uh, 
being in place, of actually enabling members of the community to come down and continue to get hospital care by maintaining a biosecurity corridor was actually, I mean, it was it was messy and we could, you know, review that and look at how we did that. But the concept itself was actually really valuable because what we found is that we, our, the inpatient flow didn't actually drop off as much as we had expected because sadly people are still coming down for unplanned care and are being medevaced out, bussed out, driven out, uh, turning up. Uh, we had a few anomalies uh, and we're needing that treatment. But I feel like now that the biosecurity has been lifted, that we're actually sort of, obviously that came with some funding, I'm assuming it was um, maybe Commonwealth, I don't, I don't know about that. But I feel like if we want to be able to maintain the safety of these different communities, that we really should be continuing to do that and still um, have a level of um, safety wrapped around, you know, what we consider to be a very vulnerable community so that they have the confidence that people can still come in and out. Because some of the conversations I've been having with both Kerry Riley and uh, Tanya McGregor is that, you know, they're really scared. And so when someone has to come down here for a treatment or someone wants to return back to community, that as a health service, that somehow we can resource and enable that. Um, but at the moment, we don't really sort of have that single point of go-to that we had under the biosecurity um, process. So I'm just wondering if you've got any thoughts on, on how we can continue to facilitate that because people are very scared. Yeah, look, you're right, um, Tricia, it is um, federal legislation, the Biosecurity Act, so I'm not sure what uh, arrangements they put in place in terms of uh, financing. Um, but clearly, um, you know, people that are living remote and regionally uh, who need to get to Adelaide for specialist services. You know, we've got some programs in place, whether or not they're adequate, we could definitely look at that because we don't want, and this is the, this I suppose was our biggest worry with COVID, was that people would say, I'm too scared to go and have my treatment or I'm too scared to go to a hospital because I might get COVID and so I'm just not going to be treated. Uh, and we did see a massive reduction in the number of people who were presenting in EDs right across the state. Um, we saw a reduction in pathology services across the state. We had fewer people going to uh, their GPs. So it really was a, a, a really big worry. And I don't know whether there was a specific response to that in terms of uh, Aboriginal South Australia, whether it's rebounded. One slight, slight um, silver lining to the otherwise dark cloud of uh, the COVID was that um, the federal government started to fund telehealth um, rebates for practitioners, which I think, quite frankly, should have happened years ago. They've been very concerned about that from just a quality assurance and anti-fraud over-servicing perspective. Um, so, but I think it, it's actually rolled out. Some of the fears that they had haven't actually eventuated. And uh, I keep, every time I speak to Greg Hunt, I'm saying you've got to keep that in place because it is hugely disruptive for people to have to come down to Adelaide if they can have that um, remotely. And one of the things that we've done in the last two years is to massively improve the telecommunications uh, with remote uh, South Australia. And anywhere that there's a school, uh, and that's in virtually every community, we have now got a good uh, link uh, with the internet, which would, I think in all but four cases in South Australia, and I think two or three of those are on Kangaroo Island, we've got really nice links now. So um, I'm hoping that that telehealth one can continue, but um, I'm very happy to um, just follow up that issue about what was available during that federal um, Biosecurity Act uh, designated area arrangement and whether there was any funding specifically uh, for that and if that's the case whether or not that could be extended because I don't think I mean to your point I think the key point you're trying to make is all right so the level of um, uh, infection has gone down but the stress levels especially in 
Aboriginal communities maybe have not gone down as much as they have in other communities. Yeah, and we still have a number of people that are caught off-country and they're not you know don't have the resources to return and there is that nervousness because they've been down here in metro now for an extended period of time that when they do return that they might bring um you know transmission with them so i'm just trying to i know that the communities are working uh individually uh with SA Health's um, Aboriginal Directorate to put in place their COVID plans. Yep. But their COVID plans are very much dependent on their connection, if there was any sort of outbreak, with basically the Royal Adelaide being the first yep. uh, hospital. So what we're trying to think through from our end is how can we be responsive uh, in a way that um, enables people to be uh, kept safe and protected and if, certainly if they're moving out um, immediate contacts into um, quarantine, uh, waiting for testing, you know, doing all those sorts of things, we are concerned about how that's going to be resourced. Yep. No, good points there. Thank you very much. Um, Alex. Is Alex. Oh, hi, thanks. Um, uh, Thank you for joining us uh, today, Premier. Um, Alex Brown's my name from Samri. Um, a couple of points, really. One framed as a comment, one as a question. Uh, the first is that we always worried with COVID that the um, we would see significant inequalities uh, given the sort of level of risk in community that we haven't seen. But what we have noticed is that the public health measures put in place to mitigate the risk of the infection spreading quickly in communities have probably affected our communities in a whole bunch of ways that are probably different to many other people. This is very clear in, in remote and regional SA, but I think it's also important in metro settings. The stay at home scenario was really, really tough. Uh, poor access to broadband for remote schooling. Um, the ability to quarantine or self-isolate was really hard. If we got cases in remote communities, we didn't even know where we would put the first patients so that they didn't transmit infection more broadly in communities, which we thought would, would spread like wildfire. So that's been an enormous concern. So that's more a comment about probably the social determinants that mean that any pandemic is hard to survive through when you're dealing with disadvantage all the time and we need to be thinking about response to that irrespective of the case numbers and then the second bit is you know obviously we've been lucky not to have cases particularly in remote south australia but what provisions do we have in place to respond when that first case does come if it comes we're assuming it will at some stage what have we got in play to make sure that we um we are there that we can surge the workforce in that needs to support the local services and and basically be there to make sure that it doesn't um, cut a sway through our communities. Yeah, well, it, it differs from community to community. I mean, in the most remote places, we did have a response plan and probably about three or four different iterations of it uh, that was developed for the AP Wylands and, and uh, Ngunnawal Health, uh, but each uh, community, my understanding is they have to develop their own action plan with regards to COVID and their own first response uh, plan. And it's not just Aboriginal communities. We had a lot of these uh, and they, they're they quite different from what exists in other parts of Australia. I'll give you a classic example. In, in South Australia, we have a protocol that if um, people uh, become infected in high density housing, um, then they are removed. Uh, this is one of the reasons why um, working really quickly, we took back the Wakefield Hospital and also College Grove and we stood up uh, facilities back at the REPAT because um, our health practitioners, in particular Professor Nicholas Spurrier, the Chief Public Health Officer, said, I just don't want people in high density housing and I don't want people in residential aged care facilities. I mean, if you look at the moment in Victoria, there are 200 um, residents in uh, residential aged care facilities and 200 staff of those uh, facilities that are infected at the moment. And it's just, it's terrible. So when we are talking about a vulnerable community uh, with aged care, we're also talking about frailties and vulnerabilities in Aboriginal communities as well. So 
Look, uh, I don't have the detail of each of those different areas, but I know that there were nine areas that had developed their action plans and that they had a first response plan. And I've got to be honest and say, when I first got on to some of the meetings with regards to some of those plans, they've changed three or four times. I mean, at one stage, you had communities talking about evacuating all of the vulnerable people from their entire community uh, from remote uh, SA down to Adelaide. You had other people saying, well, that's just moving them from a safe community to a more vulnerable community, and then all the arguments in between. And uh, look, I'm just, I, look, in some ways, Alex, I'm sort of grateful that nothing happened. Um, you know, there were plans of where people would be moved. Um, we'll never know whether they were adequate or not, but now's the time for us to not just sort of say, well, you know, we got through that, now's the time to sit down and say, well, we've got a bit more time to breathe. Let's sort of see what we can actually do to improve them. And look, you, you can't plan for these things uh, and have it 100% right, but the more effort you put in, I think the better off we're going to be. So certainly, I mean, you're, look, you're the expert, so we'll take your advice uh, on anything that we need to uh, do uh, because, uh, and, and, and from different members of the community, because we've got to get all of those things right. You know, what are we doing in terms of quarantining and isolation? What are we doing in terms of testing? Who's going to be testing? Uh, where are they going to do that testing? I mean, there are no, there's no SA pathology lab on the APY lands last time I looked. So we had to get that rapid testing uh, arrangement in place. What level of medical support is there? Do we just have one group? What happens if they get infected? Do you have to have two groups that are sort of isolated? There were a lot of effort that were put into these, but now I think it's a really good time for us to sit down and look at the adequacy of, of, of those, uh, those arrangements. And just one other thing, just to pick up on what you said, with those, um, I think you're right, people in remote uh, South Australia, whether they're in Aboriginal or, or non-Aboriginal, I mean, they're at a disadvantage because they don't have all the services that we have in Metropolitan Adelaide or some of the other bigger cities. But I'm hopeful now that we are virtually at the end of rolling out the improved internet for most of the schools. So if there are some that you're still concerned about, let my office know because I will literally put the Bunsen burner underneath them because I really want to make sure that kids in the country get the same access to that high-speed, reliable internet that they can get in the city. Mr Premier, um, some of us have got relatives, etc., who are in... Um, the prison system. Um, what sort of plans have we got for um, um, the prisons? Because um, at a previous Aboriginal Leaders Forum, we talked about prisoner health, and we're concerned that we're hearing about some of the transition um, of COVID-19 into some of the prisons in the US and potentially in other parts of Australia. What about within South Australia? What what sort of provisions that they got to ensure it doesn't run right throughout the prison population? Look, a really good question. This is one of the most vulnerable uh, communities because they're all, uh, it's like a residential aged care facility. Um, everybody is in there together and if you get one person with the infection, it can move really quickly and we've seen that at the moment uh, with I think 60 uh, sites uh, around the country essentially in lockdown. We spoke uh, with the um, corrections uh, department, but also uh, people who are in those prisons about what they wanted to do. I think we put really tight restrictions on who can visit. I, I was, to be quite honest, I wasn't sure this was going to do very well because I thought people might be really um, concerned about uh, reduced visitation, but actually, the feedback that I got was they would much rather those tight restrictions being put in place than have an outbreak there. I do want to emphasise, though, just like high density, um, uh, you know, uh, housing trust facilities and residential aged care facilities and high-rise flats, um, if we do find somebody that is uh, infected, um, we weren't just leaving them uh, to go about their normal business. I know that in Victoria at the moment, um, prison, the prison population is locked up for 23 of every 24 hours at the moment, and this is having really a massive effect on the uh, mental health of a lot of people that are, are incarcerated. So I think we've handled it well, but, you know, 
I don't want to say anything negative about what's happening in other jurisdictions because there, but for the grace of God, go. Oh, I mean, we we are very cons- we feel very fortunate to be quite honest in in South Australia that we've had a really good cooperation, uh, really with everybody. We don't have um, arguments that they have in other states. Uh, we've tried to not be too, um, you know, yelling at the population. We've just tried to educate people about the disease, how it's transmitted, uh, what what are the symptoms why it's important to get tested. And quite frankly, South Australians, I think they're just very practical people and they just say, oh, right, we've got that. We're going we're gonna to do what we can to protect ourselves and our family and our broader community. And, you know, apart from a, a couple of very small cases, we've been really uh, fortunate. Um, even things like the Black Lives Matter um, rally in South Australia, I felt very proud as the Premier of South Australia, just the way that was conducted. Um, you know, there were... There were it, I think everybody was very respectful of the fact that um, we were in the middle of a pandemic and so people maintained good social distancing or or wore a mask. I've got to say, when I saw scenes in other states and when I saw what happened in South Australia, it was peaceful, it was respectful, there were no injuries, there were no arrests, um, but there was a powerful message which was conveyed and it was supported uh, by the police commissioner and the government that I, I did actually feel very uh, proud and I think in some ways that just speaks to who we are in in South Australia that we've got this ability to look out for each other even during a pandemic in some places you're seeing uh, pretty hostile um, confrontation um, uh, and premiers having to really tell people what to do Uh, here um, Nicholas Burry really has been the front person educating people and I think you know I think we've come out the best for it. But prison populations, one that we've been really concerned about. But to date, uh, we've been very fortunate with the outcomes, Clinton. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm pretty keen to see if April's got any last comments because I want to know whether there was any impact on Aboriginal kids in relation to the work that you're doing, April. Or you heard of anything? Or do you just want to have a question or a comment before we... Um, say thank you to the Premier for his time and uh, and his approach. Thank you. I suppose it's about making um, some closing remarks in respect to um, to Aboriginal children and young people. We know, um, Premier, and thank you, Candy, um, Clinton, the harmful effects of the pandemic is, is damaging for children, um, particularly children of impoverished backgrounds. And for those who are already disadvantaged or in vulnerable situations. We know what that means for Aboriginal children and young people's health, education and social support. Their vulnerability and risk is actually exacerbated owing to the fact that we've got a very young age structure across our Aboriginal community in South Australia, you know, so the young age profile. I suppose when you look at South Australia in comparison to other states and territories, half our Aboriginal population in South Australia is under the age of 18. So, you know, we continue to be overrepresented in the youth justice, the care and protection system, and we know about the, um, you know, education outcomes in comparison to other groups of children and young people across South Australia. So my, I guess my remark is for South Australia is that when we respond to the vulnerability of Aboriginal children and young people, it will be a measure of how the state truly engages with um, reconciliation and to, you know, raise and improve the outcomes for our Aboriginal children and young people. So, you know, COVID has really exacerbated the the experience of, you know, poverty. And our kids talk about the learning that needs to happen. So it's pleasing to see that, you know, the technology that's needed to support our kids to do, to do learning in country locations, but it's an issue everywhere um, yep. for our young people. And, you know, I'd be interested to hear from yourself, um, Premier, um, with what you have, I guess, um, heard heard of from our Aboriginal communities, particularly with young people, about online learning, because those tools and those resources are taken for granted that um, our families have, and they don't. And our children are once again disadvantaged in their learning. 
Yeah, thank you, Commissioner. Look, you're right. Um, we were very concerned about Aboriginal children during the pandemic for a number of reasons. In the early days, you might recall back at the end of term one, um, there was a lot of calls for us just to close the schools down and move to remote learning uh, for term two. And we really resisted this in South Australia for a number of reasons. But for many of our children, it's really important uh, to get to school and to have uh, that framework uh, in place, uh, those uh, adults uh, that are really good supports for kids who do come from a vulnerable uh, environment. I know just speaking to premiers and other jurisdictions, it's been a real problem for them, um, not just for um, some Aboriginal students, but for many other students uh, who really need those supports that school provides. And so for all of those reasons, uh, both myself and Nicholas Spurrier and, and Stephen Wade and John Gardner, we were all really adamant that we needed to get kids back, keep the schools open uh, and that have those supports in place. But as you point out, it's a lot more difficult uh, in remote Aboriginal communities because of the Biosecurity Act. You had teachers that left that couldn't come back in or if they did come back in, they then had to isolate for 14 days and that played absolute havoc uh, with, uh, you know, term times. Uh, and look, again, I don't, I, I don't really know the answer to that, to be quite honest, because, you know, we were, we, we were looking at two competing health uh, issues. One, the teacher's potential to be infected, and on the other hand, the need to get kids uh, in front of a, a teacher in a, in a caring and nurturing uh, environment. So in the Northern Territory, they cancelled school holidays. I don't know whether people realise this, but um, Michael Gunner just said there's no school holidays because he said uh, people, if they leave that biosecurity area, how do they get back in? Um, so it was, and they, he said he had no ability to control it. And my understanding is he just said, well, we're just going straight through. Um, that wasn't the case in South Australia. But again, now's a good time for us to have a look at that. Um, you're in a very important role for our state at the moment, the first uh, Commissioner for Aboriginal Children and Young People. Congratulations uh, on that. Um, but of course, the role that you had before that um, was probably equally as important to develop that Aboriginal education strategy for our state. Um, you know, this is an area of public policy which is tough, uh, I'll be honest. You know, it's not easy. Um, it is, I mean, I think it is one of the toughest areas of public policy, but I think we do have a very good uh, Aboriginal education strategy in South Australia. And even during these tough times, we've got to be pushing it ahead with, with that. Um, but, you know, yeah, I mean, look, we, we, we wanted to keep the schools open. We kept those schools open, but you could imagine um, we've got lots of people that are frightened by what's going on, uh, even more so younger people and people from really remote South Australia. So we do owe them, um, you know, every, you know, e everything we can do to sort of educate them about what is going on and make sure that we keep those supports in place. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you again for your generosity and time, Mr. Premier, and um, the way you engage in the discussion and the questions. Um, any final comments you want to make before um, you leave? If I could, if I could just say a massive thank you to everybody. Um, this has been a tough year. I hope I never, ever have <laughs> another year like this, ever. Um, but I do feel really proud as a South Australian the way we've dealt with this. You know, where else would you want to be in the world at the moment no. than in Australia? And where in Australia would you want to be than in South Australia. So as tough as it's been, I think it's been a real test of our character. And I know that we've cancelled the Tokyo Olympics, but I reckon we've won the gold medal. So thank <laughs> yeah. you. And thank you for all your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Premier. <laughs>